Hey everyone and welcome to our second week of talking about chapter two. This week we are on to our discussion of the action potential. As you can see, I'm coming to you from the shapeless white void that is my office, but I did pick up two plants, so feels like a home, right? Okay, so today we are talking about uh, receptors and ion channels. Okay, let's talk about membrane proteins. These are proteins that are, like it sounds like, bound to the membranes of your neurons. Things we're talking about that fit in this category today are receptors, which are the initial sites of action for neurotransmitters, hormones, and drugs. Um, so where those neurotransmitters and drugs and hormones bind to do their initial thing. Ion channels, which are these protein channels that selectively allow the passage of ions via passive diffusion. Basically what we talked about uh, last time. And transporters, proteins that actively move molecules across the membrane, like the uh, sodium potassium pump that we discussed last time. Gated channels are what they sound like. They are normally closed, but open in response to specific stimuli. Uh, ion channels are specific to one or a few ions. So sodium channels, that's sodium through potassium channels, that's potassium through. Uh, there's a couple different types of gates that we're going to talk about. Ligand gated is what it sounded like. sounds like. Uh, ligand is something that binds to uh, a receptor, so a drug or neurotransmitter. So ligand-gated channels open when a ligand binds to the receptor, so the gate is governed by the presence of a ligand. Voltage-gated is what it sounds like. It op they open when the electrical potential across the membrane is sufficiently altered. So for example, a voltage-gated sodium channel, which is something we're going to talk about a lot during this unit, is a sodium channel that opens when a change in voltage is sufficient. There's also modification by second messenger system. We'll talk a bit more about second messengers in, in just a little bit, but basically uh, an extracellular event will cause the uh, activation of a second messenger, which is just like a little chemical messenger, which can then alter the state of a channel. So it's sort of a more indirect way of opening a channel. And again, we'll go over this in more detail. Postsynaptic potentials are alterations in the membrane potential. So I'll use the terms presynaptic and postsynaptic quite a bit in this course. It's just what it sounds like. So the synapse is the gap that's between two neurons, and these are relative terms. So speaking with regard to a specific synapse, the presynaptic neuron is the neuron that is going to be releasing neurotransmitters across that gap, uh, and the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that's receiving those. It's worth noting that most neurons are both presynaptic and postsynaptic, right? They receive information and they project information to other neurons. But when I say pre- and postsynaptic, it's, it's a relative term, right? I'm talking about that specific synapse and the, uh, the neuron that's releasing neurotransmitters into that synapse and the neuron that would be the presynaptic. And the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that is on the other side of that synapse, right? That is receiving the, uh, the information. Postsynaptic potentials can be excitatory, uh, meaning they depolarize the membrane. We would call that an EPSP or excitatory postsynaptic potential. They can also be inhibitory and hyperpolarize the membrane, so IPSP. These, it's determined by the ions that flow through. So if a, an event causes positively charged ions like sodium to flow into the neuron, that's going to make the membrane potential depolarized, right? It's going to make the inside of the neuron more positive. So that's a depolarization event. Whereas if, uh, let's say, a potassium channel opens and lets potassium out, a positively charged ion leaves, that's a hyperpolarization event. That's going to make the inside of the cell more negative. PSPs are graded, which means the amount of ion flow that moves through will determine the strength. So you can have large or small postsynaptic potentials de determined by the amount of ion flow that takes place. Okay, so how do ions get in or out of a cell? There's a couple different ways that we will we'll talk about. The first is the ionotropic receptor, right? This is a receptor that's bound in the membrane of the neuron that contains an ion channel. So it has both a binding site for a neurotransmitter, for example, and a channel that can allow the passage of ions. So when a molecule of neurotransmitter attaches to the binding site, it results in a shape change of this protein that's bound to the membrane. So this channel opens up and then ions can flow through it. So whatever type of ion that this channel is permeable to, that ion can now flow through freely along its gradients, right? So that, neuro, that neurotransmitter binds, opens the channel, and then ions move across concentration and electrostatic gradients. Here's looking at that a different way. So we have the extracellular side and the cytoplasmic side, 
we have our lipid bilayer and our membrane protein, this receptor that's bound in here. Here the ligand comes in, it's the right shape, so it binds to this receptor. That binding causes a conformational change in this protein, opens up this channel, and now ions can flow through. So not all receptors contain an ion channel. So not all receptors are ionotropic. We also have metabotropic receptors. So these work a little bit differently. They contain a binding site for a ligand, just like ionotropic receptors, but they don't open an ion channel within that uh, receptor, right? So if we have our metabotropic receptor right here, when a ligand binds, it's going to create sort of a cascade of events within the cell that can do a lot of different things. One thing that they can do is open an ion channel elsewhere in the membrane. So what we're showing here is a metabotropic receptor being activated by the presence of a ligand. It then, through second messenger systems, sends out a signal to these uh, ion channels that are also in the membrane nearby. The presence of that second messenger is going to cause these to open and allow the flow of ions. So these metabotropic receptors are bound to what's called G proteins. These are po proteins that are coupled to a metabotropic receptor. These convey messages to other molecules when a ligand binds with and activates the receptor. So these G proteins are what's going to allow metabotropic receptors to do some signaling with it. So let's look at that a little bit in a little bit different of a way. So the neurotransmitter comes in, binds the receptor, acts through the G protein uh, via second messenger systems to allow the opening of a ion channel nearby. So we can call this a G protein gated ion channel because it is an ion channel that is gated by the action of a G protein. So a second messenger, which I mentioned earlier, this is just a chemical produced when a G protein is activated that carries a signal that results in the opening of ion channels or could cause other events to take place. I know this seems like a pretty superficial explanation of how this works. Don't get too bogged down in the details at, at this level. Just know that the way metabotropic receptors work is that a neurotransmitter binds to this metabotropic receptor. It doesn't open an ion channel here. Instead, it activates some machinery inside the cell, right? It activates this G protein, which can then activate a second messenger, which will allow the opening of these ion channels that are gated by G protein action. So basically, metabotropic receptors just create a slower, more indirect opening of ion channels uh, for the purposes of talking about uh, post -nephron. Ionotropic channels, very fast, right? Neurotransmitter binds, channel opens, ions go through, channel closes and resets. Metabotropic receptors are a bit slower, right? Neurotransmitter binds, some things happen inside the cell, G proteins are activated, second messengers go and do their thing, and then you get some ion channels opening a little bit slower for a little bit longer. So two different mechanisms that, at least with regard to post potentials, uh, accomplish something pretty similar. And yes, if you're wondering, I, I did make this myself, and yes, I am very proud of it. That's it for the first little uh, unit of our discussion of action potentials. I'll see you next time.